Hello and welcome to our fifth episode of the Your Plate podcast. I'm Maya and I've got with me... Hi, I'm Artie. Yeah, and I am a coach and positive psychology practitioner and Artie... I'm a nutritional therapist. And this is a conversation between, you know, this is a place where positive psychology meets nutrition for busy people with lots on their plate who often need it the most. So we today are going to be talking about mindset. Uh, but before that, we wanted to give a few updates on how things have been going, what we've been up to. And specifically, we thought we'd give a few updates on Your Plate, which is what we work on together, our joint um, project. So we've had a couple of um, events. We were at a health fair. We were at the Oshwal Health Fair uh, about a month and a half ago. And then we had a masterclass earlier this month. And these have been really good ways of engaging larger groups of people uh, because we otherwise work one-to-one with our clients. And we have been really enjoying that process. But what's been great about these other events has been really interesting to hear what is front of mind for sort of larger groups of people. In particular, the masterclass, um, which we will be referring to a little bit in today's podcast, uh, was really interesting because the format of that was that we we were insight led. So we shared two or three key insights uh, that we considered to be really multidimensional for our health and well-being. But then we spent a lot of time in small group work doing, uh, you know, encouraging participants in their small groups to work on various exercises to help them actually go through their own processes of change. So what we were really keen and myself as somebody who's done a lot of workshop facilitation, what I feel really strongly about is that people don't just listen um, to a lecture, uh, but they actually work on their own personal um, um, goals and processes um, through, throughout the workshop. So we had a lot of interaction. But from that, we, we got fantastic feedback. And a lot of what we're going to talk about today builds on some of those insights and things that people shared that they found useful um, after the masterclass, um, as well as things that we, we have been working on with our own clients. So that's a little bit of an update on uh, your plate. Is there anything you wanted to add, Arati? Um, Yeah, no, I think that's a really good overview. I mean, unfortunately, I couldn't make the Oshwell Health Fair, but I heard it was a raring success, not just our stand, but lots of other people said it was a brilliant event. And um, the masterclass was brilliant, really enjoyed working with all the participants. Um, In particular, I think they really enjoyed the stuff around um, kind of the mindset work we were doing. Um, In particular, I remember a question around, you know, what are you most grateful for um, in terms of your body? So it's something I think we could come We'll, we'll I, I will, yeah, I'll definitely touch on yeah. that because we, we had some strong reactions to that, didn't we? Um, so, so yeah, so today we're gonna we're gonna start with that mindset piece because it, it was the sort of framing part of our masterclass, and actually then it, it informs a lot of the way that Arthi and I discuss nutrition and positive psychology. Um, so I'm going to start a little bit um, explaining uh, what I even mean by mindset. And by mindset, I think I'm looking at people's emotional states as well as their attitudes. And the, you know, that could be their attitudes towards their goals or their plans. Um, but it's, it's a combination of, of that emotional state as well. And Maya, I just wanted to cut in. I thought it'd be quite nice to um, refresh ourselves on the subject of positive psychology. So you're doing a master's in positive psychology, and that's you're about halfway through yes. that, are you now? Yes. So I thought it'd be quite nice for you to give us a bit, more, bit, bit, a bit of an understanding around positive psychology and what it means. Yes. Um, sort of a 101 in positive psychology. Yeah, so I, I did mention this in one of the earlier episodes, but I, I, as, as, as you say, Arati, a, a bit of a refresher for those who are not looking at this day in, day out. I think a really simple way of thinking about it is positive psychology is looking at evidence-based elements of human flourishing. Um, so it, there are we look at things like PPIs, which are interventions that are, are proven and that have evidence base in terms of improving people's psychological health. Yeah. Um, can I just ask what are PPIs? What does that stand yeah. for, please? Positive psychology interventions. Okay, brilliant. So those are little things, and I'll give you an example of a couple of those um, that are good. So, you know, it's not it, it has to be differentiated from self-help because there are studies that are carried out that inform those interventions. So you're not just, oh, my friend tried this, why don't you give it a go? It's there are there is proper evidence to support the efficacy um, mm-hmm. of these certain interventions. Um, and those are things I'll be mentioning. But yeah, so just to go back, you know, 
positive psychology is concerned with um, human flourishing. And a lot of that is psychological, but it is also looking at well-being as a whole. So the physical aspects are also there um, and the behaviours around those are also there. And I think that ties in really well. And that's why we've come together. I think that physical well-being and emotional well-being, that connection now it's, it's just, it's so recognised. Yeah. Um, and so I think, you know... You can't be having conversations one, about one and not, not the, the other. other. Exactly. Yeah. And even in my clinics, you know, even though predominantly I'm talking about nutrition, but without a shadow of doubt, there's going to be some conversations around stress levels, how that impacts energy, how that then impacts food choices. So um, that was just something I wanted to... Yes. Kind of yeah. make that connection there from my yeah, perspective. Definitely. And so so then thinking about um, the one of the contributions of positive psychology, it is around positive emotions. So I think sometimes positive psychology gets a bad press. It's all about happiness and improving happiness. And yes, that is one thing that can benefit. You can improve your happiness, um, you know, from engaging in some of the positive psychology practices. But it's looking at a lot more than that. It's also, you know, considering, you know, the evidence behind things like emotions. And so one of the things that I, I talked about at the masterclass uh, was how positive emotions can help us. Um, so Barbara Friedrichsen is one of the pioneers in this area. And if you're interested, and some of the masterclass participants were really interested, she, she's written books on this um, and, and many studies. Um, but she really was showing the benefits of positive emotions in terms of the way they boost your creativity, your determination, your resources, and that includes your psychosocial resources. So not just your psychological resources, but also the way that you interact with others. Um, and so there is so much that positive emotions can do to enhance our other capabilities. And that's why when we're thinking um, in terms of health behaviours about long-term changes, we want to harness that because often it can be our emotional state that derails us and demotivates us in our health endeavours. So that's the why why we want to talk about positive stuff and why we want to encourage positive emotions. Um and um, one of the exercises that I did, I think, speak. it was a PPI. And I can see Arthur's got a question for me around it. Um, yeah. um, so it was just around um, one of the key messages that came across in the masterclass was about building better, building habits rather yeah. than setting goals. Yes, yes. I will come to that. Okay. But one of the things around positive emotions is around the internal scripts that we have. And... Um, so what we did at the masterclass was we asked people to do three things. And these are based in, in the evidence um, around how we can start to rewrite the, our scripts. One of them is around gratitude. So Arati, I can see you've got a question for me. Yeah, so I heard this really lovely phrase, um, I think, on a YouTube um, video. And um, this endurance athlete was talking about, um, you know, we are the story that we tell ourselves so it's that internal chatter that we have to ourselves, you know, how can we sort of, if you know, if you have got negative scripts, how can we disrupt those negative scripts in the short term? Yeah. What, does, what, what is the positive psychology perspective on that from yourself? Yeah, so there's there's so many different tools that we can use and they will all be, you know, some will be more successful on, on some people than they will on others. But this is one of the things that positive psychology has looked at. What sort of interventions can we do to shift our state? Um, so one of the things that is probably a lot of you have already heard about, but I do want to share a couple of insights around it, is the gratitude one, but really make it this practical on a practical basis. So you, we'll probably all hear about gratitude. Um, for me personally, I remember being on one, my first mat leave and it was winter, I, I wasn't feeling great. And I just started using the gratitude journal every evening um, for, you know, I probably did it for a week and I noticed very quickly a shift in my mental state because all I did was write three things down that I was grateful for. There was more than enough to write about sometimes I felt that I couldn't you know narrow it down even and I added more more things but I, I really noticed a rewiring happening for me 
So that's on a personal level. But there have been countless studies uh, in positive psychology around the positive benefits of gratitude and doing writing your three good things, um, you know, say before you go to bed and how that kind of sh- starts to shift the way that you think. So what we did at the masterclass was I wanted to harness some of the different tools um, that are being used to start to, you know, confront or disrupt your, your mental scripts. And so I asked the participants to write three things down I asked them to write down one thing that they're really proud of um, in terms of what they've done um, for, for, for their body or their health one thing that they're really grateful for in terms of their health and their bodies and one thing that they really love about their bodies. And, you know, this was a masterclass around uh, nutrition and well-being. And so we focused it on on those aspects. And this produced a really, really interesting conversation in the room. So first of all, people were, were, were talking very animatedly. But a couple of people said they really struggled. They really struggled to write one thing down that they loved about their bodies. And I think that's quite, you know, telling uh, to think that people have often, you know, not taken the time or haven't reflected or have, have, have not, you know, sort of gone down that thinking mm-hmm. thinking route. So could I, can I just ask, so would potentially sort of doing a gratitude journal yes almost give you um that impetus that um it it, it challenges your 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 the the standard way that you would think about your body and it I mean does it kind of open up your mind does it make you more accepting of your body does it make you appreciate your body more would would doing something like the gratitude journal for example make that exercise easier because you're just finding it easier to express gratitude because you're practicing it every day Absolutely. And so, yeah, like I said, we made it specific because it was about health and fitness and physical. You know, that's why we made it specific. But you could do this just about all things that you're Mm. grateful for. And you sort of increase that being in that state of appreciation. So that's that was really, you know, the purpose of of doing the exercise. And yes, you could definitely, you know, sort of increase your chances of finding things that you love about yourself. Mm. But by doing these sort of activities. Um, So that was one, you know, so people people were saying they found that really hard. The other really nice thing was that at the end of the masterclass, people walked away with one keystone habit that they were going to work on. And one really sort of switched on participant said, actually, I'm going to work on doing the three good things, you know, the gratitude. But the reason I'm going to do that is because I came here saying I want to kind of improve my um, like chocolate behaviors. She was sort of reaching, found herself reaching for the chocolate and that was annoying her that she didn't have the uh, sort of in her in herbal language you know the self-control but she said actually she realized through the masterclass that it was her mood that was making her reach for the chocolate when she felt bad about herself or when she was feeling down that's when she was reaching you know for for the comfort snack and so actually she decided to work on her mental state instead Mm -hmm. and so she was doing you know she was going to be doing the gratitude uh, in order to make that connection so she'd obviously really walked away making that connection so I thought that was fantastic. Um, can I ask, and I just, um, you said the word keystone habit. Is yes. that different to habit? Well, what, I, yes, I am. I'm going to, I'm going to talk a little bit about habits um, later on. Yeah. So, and, and I can see you've got another question as well. <laughs> so the other one was around, just delve a little in, into a little bit more detail around the gratitude journal yes. and how you do it. Yes. Can you just sort of lie in bed and think of three things or is it quite important because you mentioned a journal so does yes. that mean that you should be writing those things down does yeah. it make a difference yeah it may, it does make all the difference so the the whole point of writing based activities is that you you are instead of going with what the circulating around your head you're actually putting something on paper that disrupts your typical thinking cycles Mm -hmm. so it's it's really important to commit pen to paper because then you're you're making that physical and there is research about the power of written the you know the written word versus allowing things to just kind of go around in your head the other thing and I think you had touched on this earlier with one of your questions was you know why you know how how does something like gratitude can actually help us rewire and and it's because some of our some of the way that we are wired evolution you know from an evolutionary perspective um are to focus on the negatives Mm -hmm. yeah so we've got a number of thinking um patterns or heuristics or things that we are um sort of as humans kind of programmed to do and some of those do include needing to be alert for danger and so being Mm -hmm. a you know sort of aware of the negative 
And so some of these thinking patterns, you know, they, they might have been great from a survival perspective, but they do end up uh, in most of us giving us a bit of a bias for the negative. And an exercise like this helps you to, you know, rebalance that or shift that, you know, towards a more positive, which we know, you know, from all that research on positive emotions has lots of good resourceful benefits mm. for us. So that's, that's the re- shift. Um, I think that's a really good point to make because I do... It does feel like, you know, the negative chatter can yeah. sometimes overpower that um, the kind of the hope and the optimism. And yes. it just sometimes feel like sometimes feels like it can be a downward spiral yes. sometimes when you get into that. Absolutely, Arati. So, you, you know, you've been talking about that narrative and the story and, and that's really what we're looking at here. And, you know, often these changes don't take that long for you to start noticing them. In fact, as I, as I mentioned in the masterclass, some of the mental shifts that you can start to experience as a result of, you know, daily practice of things like Gratitude Journal are a lot more dramatic you know those shifts can feel a lot more dramatic than some, you know the, the time it takes often to see some of the benefits of other health behaviors so Maya I just want to ask so how long have you been doing the gratitude journal yeah and are you able to actually keep it up for long periods of time or do you find you have a phase where you'll do it and then yeah I turn to it when I'm I'm aware that perhaps my mood is lower or something maybe has knocked me and I want to sort of restore you know you know good good state of mind um the research is actually not about doing it forever it's they've shown that the efficacy is really strong in the first few weeks of doing it and then there is some uh, adaptation so I, I personally really enjoy it. And because I'm a heavy journaler, I do end up writing nice things before I go to sleep. So whether that's nice things from the day or about my kids. And so I am doing some version of it uh, always. But if I've, you know, that's just my steady state and I do my planning at the same time. But the the evidence is actually that you don't need to, you know, do this for, forever, you know, unless you really fall in love with it, which is possibly what's happened to me. I really enjoy writing and I always have mm. um, enjoyed writing the nice things. Can I ask questions? So um, this reminds me, when I was younger, I did younger, um, sort of probably late teens, I would write a diary and it, it was just sort of writing like what had happened during the day, a few thoughts. And it was interesting. I, I maintained it for about five years and then I think it was the busyness of starting a new graduate job, which was really full on. And I, it just went out the window. Mm. And I've never got back mm. to getting back into that habit. Mm. And so did you, were, you, were you quite into writing diaries when yeah, you were Yeah, I've got it's, them since I was literally 10 years really? old. And I used to, weirdly, I used to write good things that had happened to me in the day and like write ticks next to them. And I used to write bad things that happened and write crosses next oh, to them. Right, so right. I was doing some of this stuff. So that's the thing about a lot of the positive psychology stuff is that some of it is quite intuitive and you'll realise that you, you naturally do some of it anyway. It's just that there's evidence base for, mm. you know, huge aspects of it. So I've always maintained a diary and I use it as a mixture of you know personal coaching for myself mm. um, but I also in fact it was probably going to be one of my loves of the weeks um, that I was going to talk about but so I use it for planning I use it for the me- you know my mental state um, but increasingly now that I'm aware of all of these tools that you can use because there's three good things there's silver linings there's so many we will touch on mm. other ones um, I often I often integrate those as well so anyway so that's it's sort of that's us laying a bit of a foundation for mindset, positive emotions, how they can really support us. Um, and really, it goes back to the fact that, you know, think about yourself, you know, do you when you're feeling demotivated, when you're feeling bad about yourself, when you're not, you know, in, in the best state of mind? do you engage in the most positive behaviors and supportive behaviors for your health? You know, and so I'm not, I, and, and there is again research around this. That negative mood can often inspire change, yeah? It, it's just that what we don't want to do is be in a constant state of negativity because then we're missing out on a lot of the positive emotions that can support our long term lifestyle, you know, behaviors that we want to be consistently engaging in. Um, I'm, I was just reflecting on you know, um, situations where I'm maybe feeling down. Yeah. And um, one of the things that I do is um, pick up the phone and sometimes Mm. have a chat with a friend Mm. that I know would be supportive. And I often find that, I don't know if this is the right word, but quite therapeutic. Yeah. So um, I love, I love that. I love all these tools because they're all tools that I can, you know, use for myself. Yes. But sometimes actually I find that I do need to reach out for that help. Of course. And does positive psychology have you know, does it say things around that as well, like speaking to a friend and 
um, I just find getting it off my chest basically yeah. helps me yeah, yeah, better yeah. as well as well as all the great gratitude yeah, yeah, exactly. there's no this is not you know there's one way or another this is about what's in your toolkit you know on the day when it's you know maybe 11 o'clock at night and you can't ring your friend what can you mm. do for yourself or what yeah. practices can you start to integrate on a daily basis <laughs> there is another whole separate challenge on um, positive psychology being quite individual focused um, and you know which ties in with the sort of American individualism culture and being quite focused on the self mm. um, so, but that's a whole set of challenges. The way that I use it is you use a bit of everything. Mm. You use the tools that work for you. You uh, you start to become more, you start to improve your own coping strategies. Mm. And if you've got better coping strategies, then you can, you know, support yourself well through those as well as then, of course, we all benefit from our social interactions and our friends and our, our support networks. Mm. And we would we would never say that one is more or less important. Yeah. Actually, it's, it's interesting because I, I find that, having come into this phase of life as a busy parent and our podcast is for busy parents and I thought I'd raise this is that actually I'm a little bit more aware that I don't always want to um, necessarily reach out to friends because I think right I don't want to burden them they've Mm. got their own things going on so actually that's quite relevant so I think actually learning some in some Mm. you know independent coping strategies is really powerful so I think you know, I love learning about all of this stuff because actually I found that over the last four or five years, I feel less inclined to reach out to my peer group, which may, rightly or wrongly so, just because I recognise everyone's just, really busy. Everyone's yeah. got a lot going on. And like you say, it's often at 11 o'clock at night yeah. when you've done everything and done the chores and yeah. put the kids to bed, blah, blah, blah. And it's at 11 o'clock, you kind of reflect, you think, right, God, it was a bit of a hard day. Oh, I, you know, I could have fancied mm. having a chat with... Yeah, me. Know, my, yeah, whoever, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, my best mate. But, oh, yeah. she's probably in bed, it's too late. So yeah. actually, I think it's a really, really... Really, it's, quite really, it's, it's quite really appropriate. It's quite really appropriate, isn't it, for, for that busy lifestyle yeah. stage that we're in, where you, you know, you're sensitive to the fact that you, and also just the way we 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 are. You know, it's not like we're kind of all students and surrounded by our friends all day long, or you know, in the workplace again, there's a there's a limit to you know the degree which you can share. So these are great mm. things to to have in your own coping strategy toolkit. So so that's about mindset. Now I just want to move on to habits and. We do want to be mindful of time, but I want to be aware of, um, I, I want to make the connection here between mindset now and habits. So when we when we think about, you know, our health and, you know, how we want to perhaps improve our health, people often think in terms of goals. Um, and that's, that's great. And that's a, a starting point. Um, and often when I am coaching clients, we we talk about goals initially, we talk about why they've come to the coaching, what they want to get out of coaching. But then I I often quite quickly move to their visions. So, you know, what is their vision for that area of their life? How how do they really want it to look, feel and, you know, smell? Um, and we'll do various visualization, <laughs> you know, exercises to kind of move them to a point which is quite separate from today. So, you know, it could be three years time or one year's time, you know, a, a point in time when they can kind of really imagine how that that ideal has kind of manifested itself so I I do I do you know appreciate the importance of having a vision um, and having an idea of how you want things to be and that also works with the positive psychology strength based maybe building on positive not saying I don't want this I don't want that it's actually helping people focus their minds of what they want to achieve but the second bit uh, that I think is really important when it comes to health behaviors is not getting too hung up on the goals and actually focusing more on the habits. Um, and that was one of our key insights at, at the masterclass. Yeah, well, I, that that leads me really, I mean, as you've been talking, I've been thinking, how do you, so in my clinical practice, actually one of the, I, I am quite goals focused, actually. Yeah. And it's through having had discussions with yourselves around building better habits. Yeah. I'm starting to recognise, well, actually, you need both, don't you? Yeah, you, need you the do. Habits because... goals. So I wanted to ask, how is there a balance to strike? Is one more important than the other? Yeah. Does one come before? How, how do you? No, I think how do you play uh, yeah. those well, habits well, versus goals? Well, like I said, the, quite early on, I will think about the vision, and to me, that is setting, you know, the kind of the the picture of how we want things to be, because you've got to have a direction. But then what I want to move away from is that people get hung up on the goals. And there's there's a few reasons, with, uh, you know, that goals can actually impede our pro- progress. And that's what I want people to be mindful of. So the thing about goals is that they can sometimes make us have a, a mindset that is a bit temporary. You know, wh- when I meet that goal, you know, then everything mm. will be OK. Well, what happens the day after you've met that goal? You know, what system do you have in place? So I want people to be thinking at a systems level. I want them to think, what systems have I set up for my 
myself so that yeah oops I've also I've ticked off that goal I didn't even realize but somehow my system kind of you know just set me up for it and look today you know it's it I can really see the benefits but but actually there's a lovely quote from a guy who I um really recommend reading uh, on habits um, called James Clear and he's written a book called Atomic Habits and he says that um, you the default you always default you know on your worst day to the quality of your systems so let's say you know you're a really busy person um, and you're you know you, you you're having one of your worst weeks if you've got a great system set up that is foolproof even in that busy week so you know you know when your food order's taking place you've got your meal prep sorted you've got your strategies for coping that are not onerous you know they don't rely on you speaking to a friend at midnight but they've actually you've got your own coping strategy you know you, you've basically got a system for success then you know even in your worst weeks you're still going to be looking after yourself and you've still got a way of doing that so so I want to encourage people to mm-hmm. have the systems in place. Uh, that the, is, re- I, I think that will, that will be quite revolutionary to some. What you have said mm. is, is just such a different way to mapping out kind of where you want to get to. Yeah. And that's the whole point. It sounds like it's more like a plan, yeah. whereas a goal is just a vision. Yeah. But actually the habits is the framework yeah. and provides that framework and route for you to get yeah. there. So I and think it's absolutely critical and just yeah. this whole perspective can be transformational for people and we help people to develop those systems. Yes, yes. And and that's where then again a lot of your insights around the, the way we prep and mm. the things, but they all need to then become habits that people, and this is what you know where my focus is, you know, habits that people can do in their worst weeks. Mm. And that's always my stress test. Can it work even in, otherwise it's too elaborate and I'm not interested, you know. I think that's um, a great, I, lo- I, lo- I love that stress test. Yeah. So so then the other issue with goals is that they can kind of restrict our happiness because we we think, okay, you know, at that point when I reach that goal, then I'll be happy. This particularly comes up when, it, you know, in, in terms of the physical and the body, you know, people kind of say, oh, well, once I reach this, then I'll, you know, start going swimming or then mm. I'll do, do this or whatever um, but I do feel like the achievement of a goal gives you almost cause for celebration as well yes. because you've hit this milestone yes so I kind of you know I'm, I, I'd, yes it's really interesting to sort of maybe explore the balance of it but I know and then what happens after that milestone the day after they've yeah, hit that milestone yeah that's very true I don't yeah that, I know it's so there's quite a rush of course there's a rush you know mm. and and that rush can mean that people get addicted to the milestone mm. and they'll probably get impatient to reach the milestone uh, but we are interested in long-term lifestyle changes we're not interested in you know mm. that one milestone we were interested in people sticking to it for life you know um, so th- yes of course there are a lot of people who are really you know in their personality makeup they're really achievement focused yeah and there are there are personality and strengths tests that really highlight this in certain individuals and a, a lot of us probably have this that we we get a sense of achievement from achieving things mm. and that makes us feel good um but you can get a sense of achievement from from uh, enacting your habit yeah you can get a sense of achievement from going for your run which is part of your system or you can get a sense of achievement from you know uh doing your act of self-care all you, of these things it's actually making me think as as adults we could potentially benefit this is just an idea that i'm having of having almost like a reward star chart <laughs> that you sort of put yeah. stars on every time you go for a workout and yeah. then after you know once you've got 30 similar to sometimes what we do with the kids to help yeah. you um and then you sort of maybe treat yourself to yeah. a new dress or a manicure yeah. or a pedicure i'm just i was just trying to think like how how because i feel like how That's do you so lovely, reward though. How, how can you reward well, habitual behavior exactly and 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 so this leads leads me to my last issue with goals and what we need not saying don't just to be clear I'm not saying don't have goals Mm -hmm. I want people to be mindful of how they can help us and how they can sometimes also bring out other behaviors that might not help our long-term progress the other thing to be aware of with goals is that they can create a bit of a yo-yo effect rather than a marginal gains effect so um when you know let's say you you have a certain target in mind, you don't meet that target when you wanted to, you get frustrated, you give up with your system or whatever habits you've set up. And and actually, physically, you, your body was, you know, just on the cusp of making some breakthroughs. Yeah, it's mm. just that it wasn't happening in the timeframes that you thought they should happen. 
So actually then you get, you know, annoyed with yourself and then you're on a yo-yo um, rather than this slow, steady, you know, improvement, which actually, you know, when it comes to health behaviours, that's what that's what's going to pay off in the long term. You know, the, a lot of us, I mean, I remember having to really make this shift in my mind when I was young because being somebody that sort of, you know, would do a big push before an exam and, you know, then you tick off that goal and, you know, then you can move on and you never have to look at that textbook again or whatever. But health isn't like that. Mm. Health is a day in day out thing and therefore it, re- it requires systems that support that um, and I think particularly with health the, then goals can really interfere longer term. I think the perfect example of what you're saying would be weight loss. Yeah. Pretty much 90% of my clients who are trying to lose mm. weight, they tell me, I'm, for, you know, these are the phrases, I'm forever on a diet, I've been on a diet for 20 years, um, my weight yo-yos and actually... Probably it's because they've got this goal, I want to lose one stone. Yeah. They go on this sort of like crash diet, yeah. doing, you know, like you say, not sustaining any kind of positive long-term behaviours. And then as soon as they stop that, they reach their goal, they're back back to their old ways and the weight piles yeah. on. And because then it become and then it's just a cyclical up and down. And actually, you know, the the the, the clinical research is showing now for sustained weight loss, yeah. you need to kind of be changing your way of life. Yeah. Long-term dietary habits, long-term lifestyle changes, and actually the foundation for that, I can, you know, I can make that connection is yeah. going to be good diet and lifestyle habits. Habits. And, and remember, what yeah. was that quote, um, that stat that you shared at the masterclass around vegetables that just, you know, there was a, a, a wasn't it a meta-analysis, like quite a good study around vegetable you know, consumption and that people, if they had consistently eaten vegetables over a th- three month period a yeah, year later. Three, yeah your weight loss is going to be that much more sustained because you're going to have well so with, with the great thing about vegetables is is the fiber content in vegetables yeah. keeping you fuller for longer plus all the other brilliant benefits to your gut and um, to yeah. your gut health so that in the long term once you've developed that habit yeah. of eating more vegetables not just i'm going to eat five portions of vegetables for the next three months until i've lost a weight yeah. until i've lost one stone that long term developing that habit of just eating more whole foods plant-based you know and vegetable foods over a longer period of time is going to mean that you're going to weigh i think it was about two kilos or three kilos less over a long period of time versus the people that are not eating vegetables yeah yeah which um, i think is just a lovely example of it like you know all you're doing is adding you know, vegetables to your diet. Yeah, I'm you know. asking you to add something in. Yeah, yeah, we're not even depriving. Yeah, exactly. So so that's that's my sort of what I like to set people up with in terms of goals of, uh, versus habits and, be, you know, really, because the, the other thing about habits is that you can control, I mean, you can control your habits. Obviously, sometimes we all feel out of control. And, you know, I personally, as a, somebody that, you know, always puts my hand up as a comfort eater, I don't always think I can control my, <laughs> my cravings. But you can control your habits, uh, but you can't control the outcomes. So we, even with the goals, we want to think about input and process goals. So I want to be, you know, exercising this many times a week, or I want to have, you know, I want to eat vegetables, you know, five times a day versus outcome goals. Like I want to reach this. I want to be this person. That That's an outcome goal. And mm-hmm. when it comes to health, we don't always have so much control over that outcome and when it's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, but one of the lovely things that happens, and this is, ha- you know, time and time again with my clients is we do a visualization. We talk, it could be a year in, a year in advance. It could be two years or three years in advance. And then at some point, randomly, I'll get an email and they'll tell me, You'll never believe it, but that thing that we wrote out together, you know, that vision that I had for my life that I really thought was a a dream because I asked people for their 10 out of 10, imagine everything's gone perfectly, vision. You'll never believe it, but it's all happening. And it's not like they set a date to kind of check this. It's just at a certain point when you have articulated these visions and then you set up the systems, at some point these these things will materialise. There is one other factor, which is the obstacle, which I don't, I'm not sure if we're going to get into today, which is about sort of anticipating obstacles to your habit um, habit formation. What do you think, Arti? Should we talk about that another time? Um, I think I think that's it's a really big subject. I think yeah, yeah we could um, do that another time. I think. Okay. All right. So so that's that's where we are in terms of mindset and habit. Yeah. Did you did you have anything else um, you wanted to I add, thought, Well, I, th- I love doing our love of the week. So oh, yes. I was going to ask you, Maya, um, what is your love of the week this week? Okay, so well, actually, I've I've already talked about mine, and mine is my diary. So, because okay. my, my, I wanted it to connect to this, but um, I 
last week we had a massive clear out um, before we we had um, we were hosting and I lost my diary and actually I didn't lose it it was swept under my husband's clutter on his <laughs> clutter desk and for a week I was completely lost because right now I'm juggling work commitments the summer stuff everything and it's all in this so I've actually started having always been someone using an Outlook you know calendar and things um, I've actually started using a dated diary as well because it really enables me to do my planning and things on another level mm. I lost it for a week and I was so miserable and I'm so happy to be reacquainted oh, with it brilliant and that's my love of the week <laughs> that was your 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 being reunited with yeah. your diary so my love of the week well at the moment we are in the midst of July mm. I think we are in the midst of a heat wave yeah. and I just feel like a big blob of sweat <laughs> so I am I am I've been experimenting with different ways to keep cool <laughs> and I as you know I love my ice packs generally for transporting food but at the moment they are um, keeping me nice and cool so what I'm doing at the moment <laughs> and actually at the moment while I'm recording this podcast I have taken my sh- shoes off and I have my bare feet on a big cold ice pack Mm-hmm. Now, there's a reason it's on my feet. I'm not that weird. Mm-hmm. Your feet, actually changing the temperature temperature of your feet changes your core body temperature. So I don't know if you know, you know, in the winter when it's a bit cold, when you put socks on, it just makes you feel really warm. Not just because yeah. your feet are warm, but it's warming up your, your, your whole body. So in this instance, I've got my feet on an ice pack and it is keeping me quite nice and cool so I can think and um, I would advise anyone to try that. However, I would say try and keep your ice packs, your feet ice packs different to your food ice packs because I'm not really sure about mixing those two things. So I don't know. Okay, that's a great one. So I had not realised about the feet because, but definitely I've been known to have cold towels on my feet at night. And especially when I was pregnant, oh my gosh, my feet would boil up. And so I I used to literally, and there have been times when I've also put my feet in a cold like bowl, like a tray or a saucepan at night because they're so hot. At night, how do you have a a saucepan full of water on your bed? Yeah, so I would, because our mattress, we have a low mattress. Oh, right. So I would literally have them because my feet would be the biggest problem. So yes. I didn't know their influence on it's, the rest of my yeah, body. Your core body uh, but then my one, just, I know I've done my love of the week, but I do the opposite end of the body. I do the hair. So mm. I just drench my hair. So I had to work somewhere yesterday that had no AC. So I literally put did my whole head dripping okay. under the tap. And I will be doing that later on today in this okay. podcast recording. Because my understanding was that head has a huge impact on your body temperature because oh. obviously you lose well you, cause you, you lose, lose heat, heat you can yes. lose heat very quickly from your head so I thought the quickest way to oh. cool down and I've been doing this since I was eight eight years old in India <laughs> and I had to do some pilgrimage and I was crying and then I just dunked a bottle of water oh, in my head. we want to hear about this pilgrimage yeah. at a later day <laughs> but anyway so so you're doing the feet and I'm doing the okay, head brilliant. and we're Keeping this is always nice cool. yeah. staying cool excellent all right excellent so we look forward to thanks for listening everybody and we look forward uh, to joining you again uh, for our future podcasts thank you very much bye bye <laughs>